In this module, our focus is on bioanalytical chemistry techniques that are useful in the field of chemical biology. In this particular video, what we're going to focus on is X-ray crystallography, where by the end of this video, you will be able to define and describe X-ray crystallography, provide an overview of some of its applications, and provide an outline of conducting uh, X-ray crystallography um, method. So let's go ahead and get started with looking at X-ray crystallography. So the main thing with X-ray crystallography when we're thinking about what it's going to be useful for is it is going to be one of our methods in our toolkit for determining atomic structures and molecular structures, in particular structures of crystals, hence the reason why it's called X-ray crystallography is we're using X-rays to evaluate the structures of crystalline materials. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down for you, that when we're talking about X-ray crystallography, we are referring to specifically a method for determining atomic and molecular structures. And I say atomic structures because this is one of the tools that was initially used when determining the identities of different atoms, that X-ray crystallography was a way to go about measuring and determining uh, one atom from another. It has since been used for much more complex applications, um, for example, determining the complete molecular structures of proteins. But in all cases, it is going to require that the substance being evaluated be crystalline. And that can sometimes be a challenge, as we'll get into a little bit later, because not all substances readily form crystals. Remember that a crystal absolutely is a solid material. So certainly this method doesn't work for things that are liquids. Um, and specifically, it's a solid with highly ordered repeating microscopic units. So it's a solid with highly ordered... microscopic structure. And that microscopic structure has to have repeating units. That's what gives it the crystalline form. Now, X-ray crystallography is applied towards several different applications, including being applied in the fields of material science. We're going to see that there's a broad list here. So some of the general applications are in material science, for example, novel materials that have been created, for example, as polymers or superconductors can be evaluated by X-ray crystallography to determine the complete structure of those materials, including the three-dimensional confirmation of the of the molecules that are present there. So in material science, an example would be looking at superconductors and specifically the chemical structure of those superconductors. Likewise, and somewhat overlapping with the material science side of things is a lot of applications in inorganic chemistry. So in inorganic chemistry, um, Chemists often synthesize a variety of inorganic compounds, and one common way to identify those inorganic compounds is through crystallizing that inorganic substance and determining the crystal structure through X-ray diffraction. So in inorganic chemistry, one application is the identification of inorganic compounds that have been synthesized to determine their chemical structures or confirm their chemical structures. Now, when we get into the applications related to chemical biology, we're typically interested in how can we apply X-ray crystallography toward molecules of biological relevance. And that is certainly one of the key areas where X-ray crystallography is super useful. Um, for example, in the determination of the structures of biomacromolecules, namely, X-ray crystallography has been super helpful in determining features of DNA and in proteins. In fact, much of the initial information about 
the structure of DNA, the double helical structure, was related to the crystals that were generated for DNA and X-ray crystallography. Protein crystallography has become a very useful field for determining the structures of a variety of proteins, and that ties into fields such as medicinal chemistry, where very commonly the targets of drugs are proteins. And so one st strategy that's favorable for the discovery of new drugs is that a protein of interest as a drug target is crystallized, the full three-dimensional structure of that protein is determined, and then computational techniques can be used to identify small molecule drugs that are anticipated to bind with the three-dimensional shape of that protein. In other words, you can take the three-dimensional structure of the protein that you determine through X-ray crystallography, and you can find what small molecule drug candidates would be expected to dock with that protein, meaning strongly interact and bind to that protein to either inhibit the protein if protein inhibition is what we desire, or to activate that protein and make that protein more effective in whatever its desired task is. So in medicinal chemistry, um, specifically, we can use it for drug design by determining the three-dimensional structure, meaning the tertiary structure, going back to our terminology about proteins. So you can determine the tertiary structure, ideally, of a protein that's a drug target and then you can specifically design compounds expected to interact with that target. And then finally, another application comes in and also overlaps with chemical biology, and that is that X-ray crystallography has been very useful historically for, and in current times, for the identification of small molecules. Such as Compounds like cholesterol and penicillin were initially identified based on this technique of X-ray crystallography. And those structures were determined over 50 years ago, but even to this day, X-ray crystallography is a technique that organic chemists use day in and day out to determine the complete structures of small molecules. Particularly, they are X-ray crystallography is widely used to determine the three-dimensional shapes of the molecules, so to determine the absolute configuration, whether a particular stereocenter is R or S, for example, is commonly done using X-ray crystallography. So to identify small molecules, especially the stereochemistry features. And since the exact configuration of a molecule very often drives its biological properties, this is super important um, because it allows us to know what is the required configuration of a molecule for biological activity that is observed. So how do we go about doing an X-ray crystallography experiment? What is um, X-ray crystallography from the perspective of how do we actually carry out the experiment? So when we are doing X-ray crystallography, the first step in a crystallography experiment is generating a crystal. So in the upper right corner of your screen there, you see uh, the start of the workflow for X-ray crystallography being the generation of a crystal. And generating a crystal is not a trivial task in most cases. In fact, in many cases, the most difficult step of this entire process of X-ray crystallography is actually obtaining a high quality crystal. So this very first step here, although it looks simple in words here, can often be very challenging. And this is the step that is perhaps the least likely to succeed of all of these steps, is that not all substances are amenable to forming crystals, and there's not a one-size-fits-all method for creating a crystal, be it of a small molecule or a protein or nucleic acid or whatever type of molecule you're working with, 
it's generally necessary to determine empirically on a case-by-case -case basis what's going to work for crystallizing a particular protein. So the actual crystal formation is essential but challenging. And so what do we do when we are trying to generate a crystal? So for small molecules, what is typically the case, if we're thinking of small molecules like cholesterol and penicillin and other typical organic molecules, these molecules are generally simpler to crystallize than proteins and nucleic acids because we have more flexibility in terms of what types of solvents we can use to crystallize the materials. Because in the case of small molecules, we don't have to worry about things like denaturation like we would when thinking about proteins or nucleic acids. So we're going to break this down into crystal formation for small molecules. And specifically, we focus on small organic molecules. And when we're thinking about these small organic molecules and crystallizing them, the things that we have working in our favor here is that compared to macromolecules, they have relatively limited conformational flexibility because they are small molecules. So limited conformational flexibility, meaning there isn't a huge number of bonds to rotate around, and so that limits the number of conformations, the number of three-dimensional shapes that the structure can, can adopt. And additionally, there's no concern about denaturation. There aren't um, things like extensive networks of hydrogen bonds that can break to denature the molecule, disrupting its ability to form crystals. Um, so we don't have to worry about that in the case of small molecules, unlike in the case of macromolecules where the denaturation can be a huge problem. So as a result, there are many methods for crystallizing small molecules. And generally, it's necessary to empirically determine what method will work for your particular small molecule. One thing that you could do in a practical sense is go to the literature, look for a structure that is most similar to what you've hypothesized as the likely structure of your molecule. For example, a compound that has similar functional groups may be expected to crystallize using similar methods. Um, a common way to go about crystallizing a small organic molecule is to take aliquots of that compound into a variety of different organic solvents, slowly cool those solvents, and then allow the compound of interest to crystallize out of that solution. Sometimes this process takes minutes, sometimes hours, sometimes literally months. And so pretty much drop an aliquot of your compound into a variety of organic solvents and walk away. And it's important here when thinking about this that the solvent be um, in concentration relative to the, the solute, the compound you're trying to crystallize, so that the compound of interest eventually comes out of solution. If you have tons and tons of solvent, too much solvent, the compound will remain in solution forever. So the trick is that the compound has to be just concentrated enough that will start to come out of solution in a regular recurrent pattern. And so the common way of going about crystallizing small molecules is slowly cool the solvent that you're using and wait for crystals to form. And this is done at a variety of concentrations usually and a variety of solvents. Just to hedge your bets that one or more of these solvents and concentration scenarios will work. Another thing that is sometimes done is that the crystallization will be carried out in a container that is open so that there is slow evaporation of the solvent since the solvent is presumably organic and volatile, whereas the compound of interest is not. As the solvent evaporates slowly, the compound becomes more concentrated in solution and eventually, if you're lucky, it will slowly come out of solution as 
a crystal as something that has a recurrent crystalline pattern. If you're not so lucky, then what will happen is that rather than your compound of interest coming out of solution as a crystal, instead it will come out as an amorphous material. And if it doesn't have a nice repeating structure, a crystalline form, then you absolutely cannot collect adequate x-ray crystallography data. So generally, this can be a very frustrating process of trial and error of repeating with various types of solvents, various concentrations until you get it right. If you have an unlimited amount of organic molecule to play with, you can set up a lot of different types of trials. If you are limited in the amount of compound that you have, um, because maybe you isolated this compound from a natural source and it's not particularly abundant, then this can become a massive pain. For larger molecules, macromolecules such as proteins and nucleic acids to be specific, there are some extra challenges associated with crystallizing the compound. So with macromolecules, specifically we're focusing on proteins and nucleic acids. We have to be mindful that these compounds have elaborate three-dimensional structures. We talked in our introductory module about the secondary and the tertiary structures of both proteins and nucleic acids. And if we want to determine the three-dimensional characteristics of these compounds, we have to be mindful not to denature those as we crystallize them because denaturation will prevent us from being able to observe the three-dimensional structure, which is ultimately what's important in determining the function of that molecule. And so we're really interested in the three-dimensional structure. And additionally, if we denature the molecule, it generally won't crystallize at all. It will precipitate as an amorphous compound. So when we are crystallizing, we must take care to avoid denaturation. And how do we take care to avoid denaturation? Well, the things that we can think of that denature proteins are things like placing the protein into an organic solvent. For example, ethanol is an effective disinfectant because it denatures proteins. And so we have to crystallize specifically from aqueous solutions. We have to avoid highly concentrated organic solvents. We have to avoid pH extremes. We have to avoid things like changes in temperature because remember that high temperatures can disrupt the tertiary structure of proteins as well as the secondary structure leading to that denaturation. And so um, we have to keep those things in mind. And so generally the way that crystallization of macromolecules works is in aqueous solution, um, the principle that is applied is that we want to reduce the protein solubility in the aqueous solution very slowly to coerce the formation of crystals. And a common way that that is done, there's several different ways to crystallize proteins. And again, you have to determine empirically what works for your particular protein. But often what is done is that water is evaporated very slowly from the protein solution to enable the concentration of protein to increase very slowly and eventually create crystals. And so one general way is the slow evaporation of the water solvent. And what that's gonna do is increase the protein concentration or the nucleic acid concentration very slowly and that slow increase in concentration, much like with small molecules, is one of the factors that encourages crystal formation. And so if you're really lucky, as that protein concentration increases, what will happen in the process of crystallization is that first you will get what's referred to as nucleation. That is the initial microcrystal. And the initial microcrystal as the name implies, very small, 
generally as few as about a hundred molecules in total. So tiny, tiny amounts. This is the small baby crystal. It is the start of the formation of the crystal structure, but certainly not big enough to do anything with at that point in terms of an x-ray crystallography experiment. Once nucleation has occurred, then on that nucleated microcrystal, what happens is that a larger crystal lattice starts to form. So you could think of that nucleation step as being what acts to encourage larger scale crystal formation in the container. So then after nucleation is the larger scale crystal growth. And what that yields, if you're lucky, is what we refer to as a diffraction quality crystal. If you are lucky, being the key term there. Generally, this is not a one and done type approach, but instead um, the type of scenario where a person would purify a protein until it's very, very pure, and then they would attempt to crystallize that protein using a variety of different techniques until they found one that gave a diffraction quality crystal. A diffraction quality crystal is a crystal that has an adequate number of repeating units, meaning it's a relatively large crystal, and it is of high enough quality that it's a very pure substance because the x-ray crystallography experiment relies on the substance being very pure, and that that pure substance has the necessary repeating units. So once we have created the crystals, what are we going to do next? So what we do next after we create the crystals is we actually subject them to the x-ray. So going on down our chart here, we generated a crystal, hopefully, and then we subject it to the x-rays to generate a diffraction pattern. And so what happens here in this step is once you have this nice crystal of repeating units, the crystal is placed into the x-ray diffractometer instrument for x-ray diffraction. And in that x-ray diffraction, the principle is that the presence of crystals will cause an incident x-ray beam that is coming in and striking the crystal to diffract in specific directions that relate to the exact electronic structure of that compound. So what we are going to do here in this x-ray diffraction experiment is that the presence of those crystals, that repeating unit, are going to cause an incident x-ray beam, that's the beam of x-rays coming in, to diffract in specific directions meaning at specific angles and specific intensities. So they're gonna diffract in specific directions, meaning specific angles. That's my angle symbol I just drew there. And they'll have different intensities as well. These different angles and intensities relate to the three-dimensional structure of the molecule specifically by relating to the electron density. So when we are doing x-ray diffraction, if we have our repeating pattern of units here, this is my x-ray structure that I'm, or x, this is my crystals that I'm drawing here, these repeating units. And what will happen during this diffraction is that the X-ray beam, which I'm going to draw in blue, comes in. So this is our X-ray beam coming in. This is our incident beam, in other words, going back to our definition here, our incident X-ray beam comes in. It will strike the crystals and as a result, then, 
there will be a distinct diffraction pattern. So that's what I'm showing in green is your diffracted x-rays. And the exact pattern of that diffraction is dependent upon the structure of the compound. So this pattern that we see here is specifically the angles and intensities. is going to depend on the electron density of what you're analyzing, which is of course dependent upon the overall structure of that compound. And so rather than just doing this one time, sending the x-ray beam in and looking at the diffraction, what's generally done here is this type of scenario that I'm circling here with my laser pointer is done over and over again iteratively with different angles and different parts of the crystal. So rather than just taking one x-ray diffraction pattern, instead, generally what's done is that we take a series of diffraction patterns at different orientations. So in other words, we move around that x-ray beam so that it is striking the crystal at different angles and resulting in different diffracted x-rays. And what happens then is that once we have that series of diffraction patterns, we can then assemble that into an electron density map for the compound. And so here, at step two, we see the diffraction pattern. What's generally done here is that a whole series of these is taken. And then that series is assembled together into a three-dimensional model of the structure via an electron density map. So after we get the series of patterns here, the diffraction pattern that is, and we do that experiment several times to get several diffraction patterns, then we assemble that into an electron density map because the diffraction of the x-rays is related directly to the density of electrons within the compound. And we can start to piece together, as I'm showing with the laser pointer here, regions of high and low electron density in the molecule. And so with that, we can start to deduce what particular atoms are where within the structure, especially if we know through other complementary bioanalytical experiments such as mass spectrometry, if we know what the molecular formula of the compound is, we can then start to deduce which atom is which and where in the three-dimensional electron density map of this compound. For example, if we know from mass spectrometry that we expect there's a bromine in this compound and we see a region of very high electron density, we would ascribe that to the bromine atom because bromine is a large and electronegative atom, so it has quite a high electron density. And so we build this electron density map to piece together the structure of the compound and the locations of the different atoms in three-dimensional space. We can then take that electron density map, and since all that's showing us directly is the electron density rather than showing us this position of specific atoms, we can then take that and we can fit it to a particular atomic model. So we can take those electron densities and from that information infer where the atoms have to be because the atoms have to be where the electrons are. And so we can use that to build an atomic model. And then what happens is if we realize that the atomic model is inadequate, meaning there's some regions of this where we don't quite know the locations of specific atoms, we can then refine the structure, so that's where my laser pointer comes back to the diffraction pattern, by taking additional diffraction images, additional x-rays, to feed into this pipeline to improve the electron density map and improve, hence, the atomic model to ultimately get a high-resolution structure of the protein so that we can see such fine details as the alpha helices in the proteins, as I'm highlighting here. And even in some cases, we can see small organic molecules that are docked, that are interacting with the
crystal of the protein. And that can be super useful, for example, in the case of drug discovery, because if we have a novel small molecule drug, such as this structure in orange here that I'm highlighting in the lower left corner, and we hypothesize, or we know from other evidence that it likely interacts with a protein of interest, we can crystallize those together, crystallizing both the protein with all these alpha helices in blue and the small organic molecule here in orange. If we crystallize those together and then generate crystal data, we can see exactly where within that protein structure does the drug molecule interact. And that can be super useful, for example, for things like optimizing that drug molecule further, because if we know exactly where it binds, then we can add additional functional groups to make it perhaps bind even more tightly with that protein to have the desired biological effect. So this is an extremely useful tool with the caveat being that it's necessary to determine, I mean, it's necessary to be able to generate crystals in order to do this. So that's one caveat of this X-ray crystallography method is that if you don't have crystals, you're not going to be able to do any of the cool things listed at the left. Additionally, to requiring crystals, another thing that we haven't mentioned yet, but is worth mentioning, is that this method also works best for atoms that have a relatively high atomic mass, because the high atomic mass also indicates that there will be a substantial number of electrons since the number of protons is balanced with the number of electrons in a particular atom. And so if we have a really small atom, such as hydrogen, you aren't generally going to be able to see that in the electron density map. On the other hand, massive atoms, such as bromine atoms, are wonderful because they have relatively large numbers of electrons and relatively high electron densities. And so a caveat here is that visualization of these electron density maps works best for atoms with high atomic masses. And even having just one or two relatively high atomic mass atoms, such as chlorine atoms in a structure, can often be used as a technique for helping assemble an electron density map for the entire compound. And so that can be very useful. And in the case of proteins, the presence of the repeating nitrogen and oxygen atoms are extremely valuable in enabling the determination of complete protein structures. So with that, we will conclude our discussion of X-ray diffraction. And what you should be able to, to recollect from this is an overview of the X-ray crystallography experiment, what types of applications it's useful for, what are some of the challenges of the technique, and what's a general overview of how the technique works.